The most important thing you do for your success is to take control of the suggestive elements in your environment. Be sure that what you are seeing and listening to is consistent with the goals that you want to achieve. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. The average person drives 12,000 to 25,000 miles per year, which works out to between 500 and 1,000 hours per year that the average person spends in his or her car. You can become an expert in your field by simply listening to educational audio programs as you drive from place to place. Attend seminars given by experts in your field, take additional courses and learn everything you possibly can learn from the experts. Ask them questions, write them letters, read their books, read their articles, and listen to people with proven track records in the area in which you want to be successful. It can save you years of work and thousands and thousands of dollars. Have a vision for yourself and a vision for your life. The key to having a vision is to have a dream. They say in the song, you've got to have a dream if you want to make a dream come true. Then you can fulfill your dreams. All the great movers and shakers of all of history have been dreamers. They've been people with dreams, they've been people with visions. All leaders have vision. In the book of Solomon it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And the metaphysical meaning of that is that where people lack vision, they perish inside because they lose the excitement and the thrill of life. And what most people do, because of negative experiences, because of fear of failure and so on, is they, if they have a vision at all, they tone it down so it's so small and so, so safe that it doesn't turn them on, it doesn't excite them, and they wonder why life isn't exciting. A beautiful line I read not long ago said, the best way to predict the future is to create it, which means to have a vision. And even though the vision is in the air or the sky, then build a foundation under your dreams. And when you see men and women who rise from poverty and obscurity to fame and renown, you invariably see someone who had a vision of what they could be and have and do that was far beyond what they were. Every one of us has had an experience at one time when we were small. We had a vision of growing up and having our own cars. And as we grew older, we had a vision of having our own homes and our own families. As we grew older, we had a vision of traveling and going to Europe. Wow. We fulfill all our visions. The wonderful thing is this, is that we always tend to achieve our goals. The problem is that our goals are set so low that even when we do achieve them, they don't turn us on, they don't fill us with enthusiasm. So, dream big dreams if you like and focus on results, not activities. This is the key. Be clear about the results that you're trying to accomplish. This is one of the keys of peak performance, by the way. All peak performers are results oriented all losers, underachievers, tend to be activity-oriented. And in activity orientation, what they do is they work very, very hard. Sometimes they work frantically. Sometimes they work longer hours than you do. But they lose sight of the results. Ben Trigo, the strategic thinker, said the very worst thing in the world is to do very efficiently what need not be done at all. And many of us work very, very hard to do very efficiently what need not be done at all. Anybody who's ever had employees will tell you that every single day you come across your employees doing something very diligently, but it's completely irrelevant to the success of the business. So, focus on results. Here's a key question to ask yourself when in your working life. I think it's one of the most important key questions. I'll give you two. Number one is, what results are expected of me? Not what activities, but what results or what outputs? Well, what I supposed to produce in my job? A second question you can ask yourself is, why am I on the payroll? Why am I on the payroll? So I'm going to give you a simple word that you can use for the rest of your career, which will double your income. And the word is, how? From now on, whenever you have a goal, the only question you ask is, how? Whenever you have a problem to solve, the only question you ask is how. If you have an obstacle to overcome, the only question you ask is how. 
Now, the wonderful thing about the word how is that it triggers ideas. And the ideas are all for actions that you can take immediately. And when you take those ideas, you start to get feedback, which enables you to correct your course and take even better steps to achieve your goals. So the average person, when they have a problem, complains and blames other people about the problem. Top people, when they have a problem or goal, they simply say, how could I achieve this goal? And they try this and they try that and they try something else. But it never occurs to them that they will not eventually be successful. So they think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. The key to success is, first of all, understanding. And understanding is you. As understanding is understanding yourself and understanding your world. And that takes some time. It takes some study. And the second is effort. You have to work. You have to be willing to make the efforts necessary. When I began to study Spansky and Gorchev many years ago, they called it the work. And there's always work that you have to do. If you want to become physically fit, if you want to lose weight, there's a lot of work that you have to do. Unfortunately, most people, the bottom 80% of people, are lazy. Actually, there are three types of lazy. They're lazy, very lazy, and bone lazy. And one of the greatest problems we have in our society today is lazy people who want the rewards that hardworking people get. They call the lazy people the average person. They call the successful people the millionaires and billionaires without realizing that all of those people started with nothing. Many of them were poor. Many of them were poor. Many of them were immigrants. And it took them 20 to 30 years to become financially successful. There was a politician who ran for the presidency some years ago and he said, those who've been lucky at the gaming tables of life should be forced to share their winnings with those who have not been as fortunate. Uh, that's the mindset. In other words, if you're successful, it's just luck, you know. So therefore, you don't really deserve it. So it should be taken from you and given to others. The fact is that it takes tremendous effort for you and I to achieve any kind of success. But the fact is, that there are no obstacles standing between you and any goal that you can set for yourself. You just have to learn how to do it. Every single person who is successful today was once a failure. Everyone in the top 10% started in the bottom 10%. And they set very clear goals and they learned specific things and they did things differently from the average person. And their life took off like that Mercedes. Ben's touching on the gas pedal. Their lives changed. But sometimes, the absence of one piece of knowledge can hold you back for years. And I say, never allow yourself to be held back because of the absence of a piece of knowledge or skill. All business skills are learnable. All money-making skills are learnable. All success skills are learnable. Everybody who knows them now at one time did not know them at all. And so you can learn anything you need to learn. Here's what we have found with regard to business. All business skills are learnable. You can learn any business skill that can help you to increase your earning ability. If you're in sales, you can learn any sales skill. If you want to earn money or make money, you can learn any money making skill. All business skills are learnable skills. Now you may not be able to play a violin like a great violinist or be a great athlete or a great athlete or a great artist because those are special skills. But in terms of business, you can learn any business skill because every person who has a business skill today at one time did not have that skill. And then they said that skill would help me. So they studied and practiced. And they took courses and they became good in that skill. I had a very poor education. So I thought other people were smarter than me. And if other people are smarter than you, it means that you are dumber than they are. And then I thought, well, if they're smarter than me, then they're worth more than I am. But if other people are worth more, then you must be worth less. Now, the feeling of being worthless is the biggest single problem in the world today. The feeling of being not very valuable and not very important, which leads to low self-esteem, negativity, anger, and depression. It leads to giving up, not even trying. It's the biggest problem in the world today. And high self-esteem, confidence in yourself is the greatest blessing. But here's what I found. 
Nobody is smarter than you. Nobody's better than you. Some people have different talents and abilities, but talents and abilities, but talents and abilities are spread quite evenly. So you have more talent and ability than you could use in 100 lifetimes. The essence of all human wisdom is self-knowledge and self-knowledge and self-understanding is to understand who you are, why you think and feel the way you do. Because that foundation is called interpersonal intelligence. It's been identified at Harvard as one of the foundation intelligences of great success in life. Really understanding yourself, understanding your strengths and weaknesses. You'll find that superior people are very honest about themselves. They know that they're not good at certain things, and they're not defensive, and they're not defensive. And they're better at other things, and they're quite proud of it. If you look at all spiritual doctrines, all religion, all meditation, all philosophy, all great thought, and all of history, it is to bring people to the point of thinking where they enjoy complete peace of mind. The rule is that if you set peace of mind as your highest goal, you'll probably never make another mistake. If you set peace of mind as your highest goal, everything else will fall into place. And if you achieve everything else in the world, but you do not achieve your own peace of mind, you will consider yourself a failure. You'll be unhappy, you'll be frustrated, you'll be irritated, you'll be irritated, you'll be angry, and so on. So peace of mind is the critical thing. And so, you have to keep asking yourself, what are the things that occur that give me peace of mind? When do I enjoy the highest level of peace of mind? And when you start, when you have no fear and no negative emotions, your mind is like a vacuum. What flows in is complete peace. When you have solved all your problems but everything is fine, you just feel completely at peace. And those are what are called the peak experiences of your life. Those are when you are the happiest of all. And this is not something that occurs accidentally. You walk along and you trip over some peace of mind and pick it up and put it in your pocket. You have to deliberately design your life so that you feel a great sense of peace. And of course, an extension of that is happiness. Aristotle said the ultimate aim of all human behavior is to be happy, just to achieve your own happiness. When Ayn Rand, a renowned materialist, said many years ago, she said the ultimate measure of how well you're doing as a human being is how genuinely happy you are. And if you can accomplish everything else in the world, but you're not a happy person and you don't enjoy inner peace, well then, to that degree you fail. You read these stories of people who are extremely successful, make an enormous amount of money, they snort coke, they drink themselves into oblivion, they go on tours around the country like Charlie Sheen, and then some of them go home and shoot themselves. And they've got all this money and all this fame and all this glory, but they have no sense of inner peace. So we have this little diagram here, internal versus external locus of control. This is what psychologists use. They say you have an internal locus of control here where you are happy and then you have a scale and you have an external locus of control. The internal locus of control is where you feel that you're in charge of your own life. You make your own decisions. Americans in general, by the way, have a much higher sense of inner control than most countries in the world. Europeans, 58% of Germans, for example, in highly structured economies believe that they have little or no control over their future. A person with an internal locus of control says, I make my own decisions. I am where I am, and what I am, and what I am, and what I am because of myself. I'm in charge of my life. A person with an external locus of control feels that other people are in charge of their life, their boss, their bills, and so on. Now you are here and you are moving in one direction or another with every decision that you make. The good news is that when you develop an internal locus of control, you feel really happy and strong, and you're much more positive and creative. And that's the goal that we're aiming for. The people with a high internal locus of control feel really good about themselves. They feel powerful. They feel empowered. They feel strong. Here's an interesting point. You can never give away control except to other people. You can give away your control to other people, but you still remain responsible. So control begins with your thoughts, and your thoughts determine your feelings, and your feelings, and your feelings then determine your actions. For the goals and ideals give you a sense of meaning and purpose. They make you wake up in the morning, and you're excited. You can hardly get going. 
There are a lot of people who love to sleep because they've got no reason to get up. People who are doing something and achieving something that's important, they look upon sleep as an irritation. It's something you have to do so that you're fully refreshed. But you do it as quickly as possible so you can get back to doing the stuff that makes you happy. It gives you peace of mind, fills your financial coffers and so on. There are several core areas that you must continually evaluate and assess. Number one is, what are your core competencies? What are you good at? Each individual or business starts off with a set of core skills or competencies that enable them to produce a product or service that the market wants, needs, and is willing to pay for. Each employee starts off with core competencies that enable them to make a contribution. Each company starts off with core competencies that enable them to survive and thrive in a competitive business market. The first question you must ask is, what is your company especially good at? What does your company do in an exceptional fashion? What are the special talents and skills and abilities of the people in your company that enable you to produce your products or services in a superior fashion? And remember, whatever got you to where you are today is not enough to get you any further. If you're not continually upgrading your knowledge and skills in your core areas, you're actually falling behind. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Now, here's another question with regard to core capabilities. What are you personally very good at doing? Look upon yourself as a bundle of resources that could do a variety of things. What are your special, unique, individual talents and skills that enable you to do an excellent job and achieve a worthwhile result? Again, you must be continually adding to your skill base and upgrading your existing skills just to stay even in the current market. What additional competencies will you need as a business and as an individual in the future? What are the trends in your industry? What is it that customers will be wanting one year from today and what competencies will you have to develop in order to serve your customers at the highest possible level one year from today? Spiritual development and spiritual understanding have been the goals of great minds throughout all of human history. In every culture, society, and civilization, spiritual traditions have emerged and developed spontaneously, often many thousands of miles apart. This seems to be within each person a desire to connect with something higher and greater than themselves. This inner drive seems to arise naturally and normally, often without any guidance or instruction. The great mystics and spiritual teachers of human history are those who have emerged to teach people how they can best satisfy this spiritual craving. The whole issue of spiritual development is complex and controversial. Each person who believes in a faith or a denomination is usually convinced that his or her ideas about God or a higher power are correct, and all others are wrong or misguided to some degree. The most terrible wars in human history have been religious wars fought over small differences in dogma, doctrine, or interpretation. Since most religions preach that God is a God of love, compassion, and understanding, it's sometimes amazing to look at what has been done and what continues to be done in the name of God. I've studied spiritual traditions for more than 30 years. I very much believe that spiritual development is the highest and most important form of development that a person can pursue. Rightly understood, spiritual development is the key to peace, prosperity, happiness, and personal fulfillment. About 325 BC, the philosopher Aristotle wrote his Nicomachean Ethics, one of history's finest explanations of the human condition. He begins with the observation that the common denominator of mankind is the desire to be happy. He concludes that the question of how to achieve this happiness is the fundamental question of philosophy. In 1895, Sigmund Freud of Vienna introduced his theory of psychoanalysis. His fundamental conclusion followed directly from Aristotle more than 3,000 years before. He called it the pleasure principle. Freud taught that human beings are motivated to move toward pleasure and to avoid pain, to move toward comfort and away from discomfort, whether it's physical, emotional, financial, or of any other kind. Modern economists and psychologists agree 
that every human action is stimulated by a felt dissatisfaction of some kind. Without this felt dissatisfaction no action takes place. The individual remains content and satisfied. The primary driving forces of human behavior begin with discontent, dissatisfaction, discomfort or unhappiness of some kind. Action takes place when the individual perceives a better state or condition where this unhappiness or discontent can be relieved. The individual then acts to achieve this goal. The action is either successful or unsuccessful, but all human behavior, from the beginning of man to today, is aimed at achieving a higher level of happiness than the one that currently exists. The highest human good is, and always has been, peace of mind. In fact, you can measure the success of your life at any given time by your level of happiness and peace of mind, by how good you feel about yourself and your world, Peace of mind is only possible when you feel completely satisfied and content inside. Peace of mind comes when you follow your intuition, your inner voice, and you do and say the things that feel exactly right for you. Now no one can determine what will make another person happy because each person is unique. Each person has different needs and desires and is motivated by different goals and results. Each of us can only decide for ourselves what makes us happy personally. And each of us can only decide what makes us happy by listening to our inner voice and then by following its guidance and direction. In spiritual development there are a series of simple principles that all religious traditions seem to have in common. The first principle is that there is a God who loves us, who knows us, who understands us, and who wants the very best for us. Some people refer to this as the God mind, the oversoul, universal intelligence or the creative power. It doesn't really matter what it's called, even if it's just called nature. It is a comforting thought though to believe and accept that there is a great power in the universe that we can turn to, that desires our good, and that will guide us to always doing and saying the right things if we will, but listen to the voice within us. Intuition is one of the greatest gifts of mankind. Every great thinker has been amazed at this wonderful power, and the more you listen to your intuition, the better and the more accurate it becomes. The more you listen to your inner voice, the louder and clearer it becomes in guiding you to make the right decisions in each area of your life. One of the great spiritual practices is that of solitude and contemplation. Most people have never tried the practice of solitude in their entire lives, yet it is an extraordinarily positive experience. The French writer, Blaise Pascal, wrote, Almost all the problems of mankind arise from the inability to be alone with oneself in a room for any period of time. If ever you desire an answer to any question in your life, a solution to any dilemma, the resolution to any difficulty, practice solitude. Go and sit quietly by yourself with no noise or distractions for 60 minutes. It's been said that men and women begin to become great when they begin to spend time alone with themselves listening to their inner voices. During this period of solitude, your mind will clear like silt clears in a bucket of muddy water. After about 30 minutes of quiet contemplation, you will feel calm and relaxed. You will feel happy and peaceful. You will feel at one with the universe. And then, at a certain moment as you sit there, ideas and insights will begin to flow through your mind. Whatever your current situation or dilemma, the right answer for you will come to you at exactly the right time in exactly the right form. When you arise from your period of solitude and take action on that answer, you will find that it is exactly the right thing for you to do. This is the height of spiritual perception and spiritual connection. The second principle that all the spiritual traditions have in common is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Someone once wrote that there may be a better principle for human living and the golden rule, but no one has yet discovered it. The great truths of life are simple. It's amazing how many problems, both personal and social, that could be resolved if everyone decided to treat other people the way they would like to be treated. Listen to people the way you would like to be listened to. Sell your products and services the way you would like others to sell their products and services to you. Be courteous and respectful to other people the same way you would like them to be courteous and respectful to you. Be patient and understanding with people 
when they make mistakes, the same way you would like them to be patient and understanding with you when you make mistakes. The third principle common to all religious traditions was best articulated by Immanuel Kant, the Dutch philosopher. He called it the universal maxim. He said, live your life as though your every act were to become a universal law. This is an amazing idea. Imagine if everyone lived and behaved as if everyone else was going to do exactly what he or she did. Imagine that everyone was going to treat everybody else exactly the way you treat them. This universal maxim is a tremendous discipline and guide for individual behavior. It harms no one and it helps everyone. It requires perfect truthfulness, honesty and justice. The universal maxim requires that we treat everyone alike. Living by the universal maxim requires the utmost of spiritual and personal discipline from ourselves. Here are four questions that you can ask and answer for yourself on a regular basis. They help you to incorporate the universal maxim into your life. The first question is, what kind of a world would my world be if everyone in it were just like me? Most of the problems in the world today could be solved if everyone could say that this would be a better world if everyone behaved as they do. The second question is, what kind of a country would my country be if everyone in it were just like me? Most of our social and political problems are a direct result of the refusal of people to ask this question about themselves, about others, and about our country. The third question is, what kind of a company would my company be if everyone in it was just like me? This is one of the best questions for creating a terrific place to work. The more people there are in a company who can answer this question positively, the better company it becomes in every way. The final question is this. What kind of a family would my family be if everyone in it was just like me? Imagine if everyone in your family treated everyone else in your family the way you treat everyone else in your family. What kind of a family would it be? When a book proposal is accepted by the publisher but the final manuscript has not yet been submitted, it is called a work in progress. In the same sense, each one of us is a work in progress. Each of us has a long way to go. Each of us has ample room for improvement. There are many things that each of us can do to become better human beings and better members of our societies. Asking ourselves these four questions regularly gives us guidance and insights into the specific changes and improvements we can make in ourselves. What are your values with regard to spiritual development? Do you believe in the values of peace, joy, love, compassion? forgiveness, self-control, faith, and happiness and personal fulfillment. Select the values that you consider to be the most important. Organize your values by priority from what is more important all the way through to what is least important. Put an X on your most important value and then begin to think about how you could express this value more often in your words and actions. Discipline yourself to live in harmony with your most important spiritual value. Whenever you slip, catch yourself and begin living and behaving by this value. Once again, in time, you will program this value into your subconscious mind. You will instill this value as a permanent part of your personality. You will actually transform your own character. You will become a finer and better person in every sense of the word. Now what is your vision for yourself and your life if you had complete peace of mind? Your inner life was perfect in every way, and you were completely happy and fulfilled. How would you be living your life? Think back over the happiest moments of your life. Think about the times when you felt the greatest joy and inner peace. What was going on at that time? Who were you with? What were you doing? What have been your most joyous experiences in life? What could you do to create a situation where you could enjoy more of those happy experiences in the year ahead. What should your focal point be? What one change or decision could you make that would move you more rapidly to a higher level of spiritual and inner development toward a higher level of happiness and peace? Practice zero base thinking. Look at your life and ask yourself if there is anything that you are doing that knowing what you now know you wouldn't get into again today. Is there any relationship, personal or business, that you wouldn't get into again today if you had to do it over? 
Is there any part of your business, any product or service or process or activity that you wouldn't start up again today knowing what you now know? Is there any investment or drain on your time, your emotion or your energy or money that you would not get into again today if you had to do it over knowing what you now know? Sometimes the decision to stop doing something that is no longer a source of joy or happiness in your life can bring you more peace and satisfaction than anything else. And you always know what it is. The only question is whether or not you have the courage and character to take the action that you know you need to take. What are your goals for spiritual and inner development? What specific measurable steps can you take to achieve higher levels of happiness and personal satisfaction? What can you do today to eliminate the people, forces, and influences in your life that are disrupting your happiness and peace of mind? Remember that there are only four ways to bring about the changes you desire. You can do more of some things or you can do less of others. You can start doing something or you can stop doing something else altogether. Which is it to be next? What habits and behaviors do you need to develop to become a happier person and to enjoy greater peace of mind in everything you do? Many people develop the habit of reading spiritually each morning and thinking about how they can practice what they read during the day. Others develop the habit of daily solitude. Some develop the habit of attending a church that they enjoy on a regular basis. One spiritual habit is to donate your time to working with people who are less fortunate than you are. Spending time with other spiritually developed people is another great habit that helps you to develop spiritually as well. The daily activities that you could begin practicing to increase your levels of spiritual development and inner peace. Whatever you do, anything that you repeat over and over again will eventually become a new habit. What are the specific activities that you would like to develop into habits? Finally, make a specific action commitment. Decide upon one step that you are going to take today to begin moving toward higher levels of spiritual development and peace of mind. Either get in or get out. Either start doing something or stop doing something else. Make a decision of some kind and then take action on your decision. Determine your focal point. Put an X on the one decision or activity that can have the most immediate positive impact on your level of personal happiness and inner joy. Whatever it is, just do it. Perhaps the most important spiritual principle of all is for you to develop an unshakable trust in the universe and in goodness of God or of a higher power. Look for the good in every situation. Look for something beneficial that you can gain from every setback or difficulty. Have complete confidence and faith that everything that is happening to you is happening for a good reason, however it appears at the moment. The reason is usually to help you to be more successful and happy in the future. Norman Vincent Peale used to say, when God wants to send you a gift, he wraps it up in a problem. The bigger the gift that God wants to send you, the bigger the problem he wraps it up in. In hundreds of interviews for the most successful men and women of the age, the researchers found that they all had a single thinking quality in common. They all believed that within every difficulty and problem they faced, there was something good or helpful that they could benefit from. Look for the valuable lesson in every difficulty. Have complete faith that there is a divine intelligence that cares about you and which is guiding your path every step of the way. When you begin practicing this way of thinking, you'll be amazed at the wonderful things that will happen in your life. One of the great spiritual principles is for you to identify the biggest single problem in your life today. What is it? Then look into that problem and imagine that it has been sent to you at this moment to teach you something that you need to know. Imagine that this problem has been artfully constructed to contain one or more valuable lessons that you absolutely need to learn to move to the next level of success and happiness in your life. All great men and women are men and women of faith. They have complete confidence that everything is unfolding for their good, even if they cannot see it at the moment. They believe that every setback has a benefit or opportunity hidden within it. They have complete faith that everything is happening as it should, and that in the end, everything will turn out well, and they are seldom disappointed. Spiritual development and peace of mind are the highest of all human goods and benefits. Spiritual development enhances your life and fills you with joy and satisfaction. It makes you happy.
It gives you tremendous pleasure. Best of all, it is available to you and to everyone at no cost. Developing spiritually and enjoying peace of mind simply requires that you live in truth with yourself and with everyone around you. Spiritual development requires that you trust in the universe to guide and direct your path. Spiritual development requires that you take time each day to sit quietly by yourself and to listen for the still small voice within. Spiritual development requires that you follow the guidance of your intuition and believe absolutely that everything is working out for the best. When you begin to live in truth with yourself and others and trust your inner voice, you will probably never make another mistake. You will make your life into something truly wonderful and inspiring. And it's completely up to you. Now let's wrap up with seven rules for success in the 21st century. These are some of the most important ideas I have learned in more than 30 years of studying successful people. Rule number one. Your life only gets better when you get better. Your outer world will always be a reflection of your inner world. If you want to improve the quality of your outer world, you must go to work on yourself. And since there's no limit on how much better you can get, there's no limit to how much better you can make your life. Rule number two for the 21st century, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. All that really matters is where you're going. Never allow yourself to be slowed down or held back by events that have occurred in your past. Learn from them and let them go. Resolve to keep yourself focused on the future and where you're going most of the time. And since your future is only limited by your imagination, there are no limits to what you can achieve in the months and years ahead. Rule number three. Anything worth doing well is worth doing poorly at first. Remember, everything is hard before it's easy. A primary reason that people do not realize their full potentials is that they try something new and when it doesn't work perfectly the first time, they quit and go back to their old lower level of performance. Anything worth doing well is worth doing poorly at first and it's often worth doing poorly several times until you master it. Rule number four. You are only as free as your options. The well-developed alternatives you have available to you. One of the greatest human goods is personal freedom, and your freedom is largely determined by your choices. The more options you have, the greater freedom and self-confidence you have. You should be continually developing new options throughout your career. Never hang all of your hopes for success on a single possibility. Rule number five. Within every problem or difficulty you experience, there is the seed of an equal or greater advantage or benefit. Look for the good in every problem. Look for the valuable lesson in every adversity or setback. Look for something that you can gain from every difficulty and you will always find it. Rule number six. You can learn anything you need to learn to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. You are designed by nature to be a learning organism. Anything that anyone else has learned. Within reason, you can learn as well. You can acquire any kind of knowledge and develop any skill that you need to rise to the top of your field. And finally, rule number seven. The only real limits on what you can do or be are the limits you accept in your own mind. As Shakespeare said, nothing is but thinking makes it so. Henry Ford said, if you believe you can do a thing or you believe you cannot, in either case, you're probably right. You have within you right now all the talents and abilities you could ever want or need to achieve any goal or dream you can set for yourself. The only question you ever have to ask is, how badly do you want it? If you want anything badly enough and you're willing to persist long enough, nothing can stop you from eventually achieving it. Good luck. If you enjoyed this program for Master Motivator and Success Coach Brian Tracy, you are probably the type of high achiever that would benefit from Brian Tracy's personal success coaching program. This one on one coaching program is unlike any self-development tool ever offer. Imagine spending 12 weeks with your own coach who has been personally trained by Brian Tracy. Your coach will aid you in building your life strategies, guiding you as you take action steps toward making your greatest desires a reality. If you are like many, you often set goals that sometimes lack the motivation to carry them through.
With the ongoing nurturing and guidance of your personal coach and this outstanding program, you will be accountable for the changes you want to make in your life and you'll soon see those changes becoming a reality. Created exclusively for Nightingale Connect by Brian Tracy, this program has had massive life changing results on those who have committed themselves to it. It consists of a minimum of 12 weeks of 30 minute one on one telecoaching sessions with a trained personal coach. Accompanying the program are 12 cassette tapes, one for each week of study, along with a guidebook. This extraordinary program focuses on every aspect of your life and helps integrate and balance your life success skills along with your business growth. Brian Tracy's personal success coaching program offers you guidance in the areas of strategic planning, intelligence, health and fitness, power, career success, time management, financial planning, life success, relationships, goal setting, leadership, and building character. Your life will magically transform as you turn your conceptualized thoughts into active steps toward achieving your goals. Brian Tracy's personal success coaching program is one of the most comprehensive, powerful self-development programs to date and is designed to fit your goals, dreams, and desires both personally and professionally. Act now today and call in to receive further information in your free personal success profile with one of our trained personal development representatives. Designed with Brian Tracy, this profile will identify your strengths and pinpoint your growth opportunities. We offer this analysis to you at no cost and no obligation. So don't delay. To register for this outstanding coaching program or to receive your free personal success profile, call Nightingale Connett now at this number. 1-877-297-9799. That's 1-877-297-9799. And as for Brian Tracy's personal success coaching profile, it's one phone call that could change your life. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. What you think becomes your reality. Earl Nightingale in his audio program The Strangest Secret says that you become what you think about. Ralph Waldo Emerson summarized this idea more than a hundred years before by saying, a man becomes what he thinks about most of the time. The law of mind is extremely powerful and is in many ways a basic law for explaining many of the other laws that refer to mind action. The natural extension of the law of mind is the third law of success called the law of mental equivalency. This law says that your primary responsibility to yourself is to create a clear and accurate mental equivalent of what you wish to experience in each dimension of your external life. If you want to be happy, you need to clearly define for yourself and create the mental equivalent or picture of exactly what happiness means to you. If you wish to enjoy health and long life or happy relationships or financial prosperity, you need to create in your mind an exact detailed picture of what you desire. As a result of a whole series of other laws that I'll be discussing, this becomes the critical starting point that begins inevitably to lead you to the realization of your dreams and goals. The fourth law of success is called the law of correspondence. This law has been talked about for perhaps 4,000 years and it's one of the fundamental laws that explains human experience. It simply says that, as within, so without. It says that your outer life will tend to be a mirror image of your inner life. Your external world will tend to correspond almost exactly to what is going on inside both your conscious and subconscious minds. There are four major areas where you see the law of correspondence working all the time. The first is simply in your attitude. Whatever your attitude is, often before you even say anything, people will reflect it back to you in the way they talk to you and treat you. As within, so without. The second area where the law of correspondence is evident is in your relationships. Your relationships will almost perfectly mirror your attitude and your personality. If you're a good and happy person, you'll have good and happy relationships. As you become a more patient and tolerant and loving person, your relationships will reflect this 
almost immediately, very much as a mirror will do. The third area of correspondence that you see is in your health. Much of your health can be directly traced to specific attitudes that cause you to suffer from minor and major illnesses. The extensive work that's been done in the area of holistic medicine seems to suggest that there are corresponding attitudes of mind for most illnesses that you or I suffer, from the common cold and flu all the way up to the most serious illnesses that are often life-threatening. Whenever you're anxious or upset or unhappy for any reason, for any period of time, your body will begin to reflect those feelings. The entire basis of psychosomatic medicine is the conclusion that your mind, psycho, makes your body, soma, sick. What your mind harbors, your body eventually expresses. The fourth application of the law of correspondence is that your external world of material accomplishment will exactly correspond to your internal world of preparation. The more knowledge and skill you gain that helps you to be more effective in your work, the more you will be paid. You can't hope to acquire or achieve anything more on the outside until you've acquired it or achieved it on the inside. The law of correspondence reigns supreme. The fifth law of success is the law of belief which says that whatever you believe in with emotion becomes your reality. You always have a tendency to act in a manner consistent with your innermost beliefs and convictions. Your beliefs, in fact, act like a filter or a screen that edit out incoming information and only allows into your conscious awareness the things that you already decided are true about yourself and the world. William James of Harvard said, Belief creates the actual fact. In the Bible it says, Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For example, if you absolutely believe that you are meant to be a great success in life and that no matter what happens, nothing can stop you from achieving the greatness that is yours, you'll act in a manner consistent with that belief and you'll eventually make it come true. If you doubt your ability to be successful for any reason, this negative belief will be demonstrated in your tendency to hold yourself back. The most important part of the law of belief is the necessity for you to question your own self-limiting beliefs. These are the beliefs that act like the brakes on your potential. These are the nagging doubts and fears that people have about themselves and their abilities that cause them to sell themselves short. When you have self-limiting beliefs, you have the tendency to settle for far less than you may be capable of. Self-limiting beliefs revolve around your ability to lose weight or quit smoking or earn a certain amount of money or be attractive to members of the opposite sex or develop new abilities that are more conducive to your success and happiness. One of the most important steps you can take toward achieving great success is for you to question these self-limiting beliefs. You might even ask others who know you well what self-limiting beliefs they seem to think that you have that may be holding you back. Remember, self-limiting beliefs are often used as excuses. A good way to test your self-limiting beliefs is to ask yourself whether anyone else but the limitations you perceive you have has nonetheless gone on to achieve success. You can also look at your own actions to decide what it is that you truly value. Remember, it's not what you say or hope or wish or intend that is a true expression of your values and beliefs. It's only what you do. Children are very aware of this and they ignore the advice of their parents when their parents say, do as I say, not as I do. The fact is, we all seem to know that a person's actions are the true reflection of their innermost convictions. There's a great deal of confusion and unhappiness in the world today because many people feel that if they say something emphatically enough or write about it, it means that they truly believe it. But this is false. You only truly believe what you do. Your actions do speak far more loudly than your words. For example, if you truly believe in the values of persistence and dedication, it will be evident in the things that you do every single day. If you truly believe in the values of honesty and integrity and self-discipline, you will demonstrate these qualities in your every behavior. In fact, you can tell what a person values by looking at what they did in the past when the pressure was on. It's only when you're forced to make a choice that you know what it is 
you really value. For example, when you have to choose between family and work or between money and honesty, your true values come out. The wonderful and important thing about your values is that you can develop them in yourself by disciplining yourself to act consistent with them, even if you haven't yet made them a fixed part of your character. I'll explain this later in the program. The seventh law of success is the law of motivation, which says that everything you do is triggered by inner desires and urges and instincts, many of which may be at an unconscious level, and your attitudes and behaviors will be determined by your dominant motivations, by what you really want and need in life, not by what you think you want. This is an extension of the law of values, and it's very important for you to understand. There's a simple formula called the ABC formula of human motivation and human action. The ABC stands for antecedents, behavior, and consequences. The antecedents are the things that happen before the behavior. The behaviors are the things you do. The consequences are what happens as a result of your behavior. We know that psychologically only about 15% of your motivation comes from the antecedents from what you read or learn or are told to do or not do. However, about 85% of your motivation comes from your expectations, what you think will happen. It's your beliefs about the consequences, about the future, that causes you to behave in a certain way. The clearer you are about the consequences of your actions, and the more intensely you desire to enjoy the consequences that your behaviors may lead to, the more motivated you'll be. This is why it's so important to have absolute clarity with regard to your goals in each area of your life in order for you to be motivated to perform at your very best. An important point with regard to the ABC formula is that your behaviors are not guaranteed to achieve the consequences that you desire. But every behavior or action that you engage in will generate a consequence of some kind. One of the most important parts of understanding motivation and behavior is to realize that both actions and inactions have consequences. What you do, as well as what you fail to do, will have a consequence in your future, and sometimes the consequences can be dramatic and long-lasting. A good exercise in success is for you to write out a description of the type of person that you'd like to be and the kind of life that you'd like to be living. The most powerful faculty that you have is your ability to think, your ability to understand. The more accurately you can think about who you are and what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it, the more effective and successful you will be. The eighth law of success is the law of subconscious activity, and it has several applications. The first part of this law is that whatever thought or idea mixed with emotion you hold in your conscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind. This means that whatever thought, idea, or goal you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have, because your subconscious mind will go to work to organize all of your thoughts and actions to bring it into your reality. If you desire to earn or attain a certain amount of money, and you think about it continually day and night, and you use every means possible to drive this desire or hope deep into your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind will begin committing more and more of its reserve capacity toward bringing that goal or desire into your life. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, once you give it the proper commands, will trigger your reticular cortex and its function, the reticular activating system. Your reticular cortex is a small, finger-like part of your brain that alerts you to events and circumstances around you that are consistent with your dominant desires or concerns. For example, if you decided that you wanted to buy a red sports car, this desire would signal to your reticular cortex that red sports cars are now of paramount importance to you. From that moment on, you would see red sports cars everywhere, even a block away. You would become extremely alert and sensitive to red sports cars, as well as to the means of attaining one of them. If one of your goals is to achieve financial independence, and you imbue this goal with intense desire, 
Your reticular cortex will cause you to be extremely sensitive to all kinds of opportunities around you that would help you to earn more money. You would hear and see things everywhere that you might have been unaware of completely in the absence of having established this goal and planted it in your subconscious mind. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, which controls your autonomic nervous system and all of your muscles, nerves, actions and reactions, also controls your body language and your tone of voice. Professor Moravian of the University of California at Santa Barbara has concluded that when you communicate with others, fully 55% of the message you send is contained in your body language. 38% of the message you send is contained in your tone of voice and only 7% of the message is contained in the actual words that you use. And your body language and tone of voice is largely controlled by messages about yourself and your goals that you've sent to your subconscious mind as the result of the way you think and feel. For example, when you've had a success of any kind, you send a charge of emotional energy to your subconscious mind that tells it that you're a winner. For some time afterwards, you walk and talk and act and think like a winner. Your step will be brisker, your voice will be stronger, your eyes will be more focused, and your body language will signify this belief about yourself. Your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your entire body, voice, and tone to fit a pattern consistent with it. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations. It's often called the law of the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's one of the most powerful of all laws because of its simplicity and its predictability. This law simply says that whatever you expect, with confidence, will have a tendency to materialize in your life. You get not what you want, but what you expect with the greatest intensity. For this reason, an attitude of positive self-expectancy seems to go hand in hand with great success in every area of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk and talk and act as though you believe the entire world was conspiring to help you to achieve your goals. You can become what W. Clement Stone often referred to as an inverse paranoid. You can become convinced that the entire world is conspiring to do you good. The way that you apply the law of expectations is by confidently looking for the good in every person and every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look into the setback for the valuable lesson that it might contain. Instead of becoming upset, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This kind of affirmation causes you to approach everything you do with a more positive and open and optimistic attitude. The most powerful of all expectations are the expectations you have of yourself. You should approach everything you do with an attitude of calm, confident self-expectancy. You should expect to be successful more times than you're unsuccessful. Expect to win more times than you lose and expect to eventually achieve your goals if you carry on long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It says that whatever you concentrate on and think about repeatedly with emotion tends to become more and more a part of your inner and outer life. Some of the most important work in psychology shows that if you dwell upon qualities that you wish to develop like courage and sincerity and persistence, you tend to actually build those qualities brick by brick into your character and personality. The law of concentration goes hand in hand with the law of subconscious activity and it largely explains the person that you are today. Whatever you've concentrated on in the past and are concentrating on in the present is having a major impact on your conduct and behavior. What you concentrate on largely determines the quality and quantity of the results that you get and the success that you enjoy. The eleventh law of success is the law of habit. It says that virtually everything that you do is automatic and unthinking. You are largely a creature of habit. It says that from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance and to do the things that you've become accustomed to doing in the past. 
You eat the same foods for breakfast, you brush your teeth with the same toothpaste, you take the same route to work, you greet people with the same words, you go to lunch at the same time, you work in the same way. Now, there's nothing wrong with establishing habits that enable you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the degree to which many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, such as driving a car, have become automatic and unthinking. When you make certain things habitual so they no longer require thought, your mind then becomes free to concentrate on other things that can be more helpful to you in achieving the things that you really want. There are several parts of the law of habit, and the first of these is that good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. The second part is that bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. One of the hardest of all things to change are bad habits which are counterproductive to the goals that you want to achieve. It's therefore important for you to sit down and think through the habits that you have and analyze them carefully. You need to decide whether or not they are moving you towards your goals or away from them. Remember, one of the most important of all observations on success is that everything you do either moves you in one direction or moves you in the other. Nothing is neutral. Everything counts. If a habit isn't helpful, it is hurtful. If a habit is not leading you to success, it's probably leading you to failure. The way that you overcome bad habits is simply to override them by the development of new, more positive habits. For example, if you have a golf swing that's causing your balls to go into the rough, you can override that habitual swing by taking lessons and learning how to hit the ball differently. If you had a habit of getting up later than you should, you can override that habit by repeatedly getting up earlier until that new behavior becomes the habit that dominates your thinking and your actions. By practicing the law of concentration in conjunction with the law of habit and thinking continually about how you would be with a new habit or behavior, you drive this message into your subconscious mind and you'll eventually begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you wish to form. This brings us to the twelfth law one of the most important of all the laws of success, and that is the law of attraction. The law of attraction says that you are a living magnet, and that you inevitably attract into your life the people, events, and circumstances that harmonize with your dominant thoughts. This is why we say that whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have. Whatever thought you hold clearly and mix with emotion begins setting up a force field of mental energy that begins drawing towards you the things that you need to achieve that goal. This law of attraction has been written about for hundreds if not thousands of years. It's contained in the old folk sayings, like attracts like, or like begets like. Or you've perhaps heard, birds of a feather flock together. My friend Mark Victor Hansen says that, Whatever you want, wants you. These are all ways of saying that your mind is extremely powerful and that whatever you think, emotionalized, becomes a form of energy like a magnet that's attracting the events and circumstances you experience into your life. In music, the law of attraction is often referred to as the law of sympathetic resonance. It explains, for example, that if you have two pianos in a large room and you hit the key of C on one of the pianos, and then walk across the room to the other piano, the C note or string on the second piano will be vibrating in perfect harmony or resonance with the C string on the first piano. One of the most common examples of this law is when you enter a room full of people and you almost invariably have a sympathetic resonance or attraction with someone else in the room. You'll have a tendency to gravitate toward a person with whom you are comfortable and compatible, and that person will have a tendency to gravitate towards you. Very often, two single people at a social gathering will have a level of sympathetic resonance that draws them toward each other and into conversation. By the same token, when you have a very clear goal or idea, you will attend to attract people to you and be attracted to people who have ideas and information and resources that can help you to realize that goal. Another illustration of the law of attraction is its opposite, which is the law of repulsion. When you begin to become a particular kind of person, because of the way you change your thinking, you will find yourself attracted to people who are similar to you, and you will also find yourself repelling 
and being repelled by people who don't think the way you do. This law explains why positive people tend to associate with other positive people and why negative people tend to associate with other negative people and why neither group finds the other group of very much interest. You can begin to fill your life with the kind of people that you respect and admire by simply becoming the kind of person in your thoughts that will attract them to you. The thirteenth law of success is the law of choice, which says that you are always free to choose the content of your conscious mind, but in so doing you are choosing every other part of your life. Your thoughts control your reality, and since no one else but you can think for you, the thoughts that you choose to harbor determine everything that happens in your life. The wonderful thing about the law of choice is that it says that you have complete freedom to think and therefore to be anything that you intensely desire. The choice is always up to you. The law of choice also says that you are where you are and what you are because you have chosen to be there. If you're not happy with where you are and what you are, it's up to you to choose to be and do something else. The fourteenth law of success is the law of optimism, which simply says that a positive mental attitude goes hand in hand with success and happiness in virtually every dimension of life. The quality of optimism is the quality that makes you into a cheerful and pleasant person, a person that other people like and want to be around and help. The most successful men and women tend to be very likable people. The more optimistic you are, the happier you will be moment to moment and the more things you'll be willing to attempt. The fifteenth law of success, the law of change, says simply that change is inevitable. The only constant we have in life is that of change. Everything is changing even as you listen to this tape. But the wonderful thing about the law of change is that nothing is fixed either. All progress requires change and since change is happening in any case, you can be and have and do anything you want by simply harnessing the forces of change and taking advantage of them. The law of change also says that your life can only get better when you get better, but not until. It says that you can't remain the same and somehow improve. The law says that if you don't take advantage of change, you will end up being the victim of change. Things will happen over which you have little or no control, and you'll simply have to go along and adjust your actions and behaviors to whatever occurs. Now, let me tell you a story that is true in more cases than not. Once upon a time, there was a young man from an average home with an average education working at an average job and who had an average group of friends. Like most average young men, he was primarily interested in girls and sports and television. He liked to have a good time and he spent most of his money enjoying himself. He looked upon his job as a necessary evil that paid for his average lifestyle. And, like most average people, he was going nowhere with his life. Then one day, something happened to him. Perhaps he read a book that woke him up, or listened to an audio program, or attended a motivational seminar. Whatever it was, he wasn't the same afterwards. He realized that he could choose to do and be something else. He applied the law of choice. By the law of change, he realized that his life could only improve if he began changing in a positive direction. Using the law of cause and effect, he made some decisions about what he wanted to accomplish and then began searching out the causes of the effects he desired. By the law of optimism, he was positive toward himself and his possibilities. He expected good things to happen, triggering the law of expectations. He went to work on his thinking and he began to dwell, the law of concentration, on his ideal lifestyle. By the law of subconscious activity, he began to walk and talk like the person he envisioned himself becoming. He also began noticing opportunities to advance himself that he hadn't seen before. As he changed his thinking, he triggered the law of mind and the law of mental equivalency, and he created a clear picture of his goals. By the law of correspondence, his outer world began to reflect his new, improved inner world. His beliefs about himself began to change, and by the law of attraction, people and resources began to appear to help him move toward his goal. As he concentrated on his desires, 
his values and motivations changed and he began developing the kind of habits that lead to success. In no time at all, by bringing his life into alignment and harmony with the laws of success, he began moving forward at a rate that surprised even him. And so can you. The laws of success are based on the foundation principle that in order for you to succeed, you must first decide what success means to you. You can then begin to apply these laws to your definition of success to bring it more rapidly into your reality. How comes such a difference from those who can reach such incredible heights and those who haven't yet found the answers for their life and their health and their health and their future? We just have to ponder that and let that give us a note of seriousness. It's serious whether you win or lose. It's serious whether you'd succeed or fail. It's serious whether you've got a good future carved out for yourself or you do not have. Here's how to really cash in on this year. Number one, it's serious. Life is serious. Life is serious. We call it life or death. Next, to make this your best year ever, have a piece of the 400 million. See what you can do. Touch the lives of as many people as you can possibly touch. Number one, let's get serious. Here's number two, get smart. That's what these journals are for. That's what these journals are for. That's what pad and pencil are for. That's what taking notes is for. See if you can't increase your ability to comprehend ideas. Information that can be life transforming. Don't miss the opportunity to learn. Take a good key phrase home. Use it in your training. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be casual in learning. Develop a whole new intensity for the 90s that you're not going to miss the information. You're not going to miss the stories. You're not going to miss the details. Get smart. Here's a couple of parts to it. Number one. Your own personal experience, right? If you've had a bad week, just sit down and ponder that for a while. Study it. See if you can't pick up some ideas from a poor week. And then make a better week. Learn from your own experiences. One way to learn to do it right is to do it wrong. And, you know, that's one way to learn to do it right. Do it wrong. Now, the key is, don't let it take too long. If you've done it wrong for a year, we suggest that's long enough. You don't need another year just to prove a point. One year is enough. Learn from your own experience, right? So the call didn't go well, all that stuff. Guess what they did? When they finished that call, they made another call. What else could we do to make it better? How could we possibly improve? This is called the possibility for life change starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up the ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. That's why you've heard from some people that have shared their testimonial here and given you some of their ideas, ways and means of taking this product to the marketplace, making it work for you. We've devoted most of our time for that and well, we should. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of life change. So education, get smart. Don't miss the training class. You say, well, I've already been to one of those classes. I've already heard it. I've got a good phrase for you to take home. That's no sign you got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time is no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning in 1992. When I travel with Mark Hughes, he's got his book open. He's reading, he's studying lives of successful people, lives of despicable people. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop, Never let it be said you didn't learn right. If you want to solve your problems, you've got to learn. You want to take advantage of an opportunity, you've got to learn. We can't come here and just give you the marketing plan, give you the product, send you home. We've got to stay for a while, learn. Stay for a while, right? Put on those cassettes and stay for a while, right? We ask you to come here for a couple of days and stay for a while. Do some learning, take it back home. So, number two, to have your best year ever, a good piece of that 400 million. Make your dreams come true. Number one, get serious. Number two, get smart. Develop your own personal philosophy here. Philosophy, a major determining factor in how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is like the set of the sail. The same wind blows on us all. The difference in where we arrive at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, it's not the wind that blows. And the wind is blowing around the world. 
The world is in solution. Things are changing. The walls have come down. All kinds of things that are happening in Russia tonight, today. The winds are blowing, but what's going to make the major difference? Each person's personal philosophy that sets a better sail, sets a better sail. So don't ask for a more favorable wind. That's like wishing something that's not going to occur. Don't ask for better seed and soil. All you got is what's available. Don't curse what you got on this planet. All we got is the seed that's here, the soil that's here, the soil that's here, the miracle of life that's here, the opportunity that's here, the yachts here, the seasons that are here. That's all we got. Wherever you've come from in your country, the economy you got, that's all you got. In America, our economy, that's all we got. The government, that's all we got. The marketplace, that's all we got. The marketplace, that's all we got. Whatever you do, don't criticize. All you got. The key is to set a better sail and turn what you've got into the miracle of your future. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. That's the reason for coming here, spending a couple of days of intense effort, taking notes, rolling up your sleeves, is going to work. Commit yourself to learning so that you can get smarter for the days ahead. Develop your philosophy. Herbalife's philosophy has carried it now these 12 years to extraordinary heights. Those who do the work get prepared. A philosophy that commits itself to having the finest, no matter what it costs. That kind of polarity, I'm asking you to develop your own personal philosophy. Get your business philosophy going, get your financial plan going. Don't violate the conclusions of your own philosophy by not executing and taking action, but that's number two. Get smart. Here's number three. Get going. As smart as you might become after these two A's, as many ideas as you take away from here, they're truly, as Larry mentioned, like seeds to be planted in the soil. You've got to get going. You've got to take action. The disciplines of the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going as far as disciplines are concerned. Number one, do what you can. You might go home, set a whole new pace for yourself, and we call it cleaning up neglect. You should walk around the block, and walk around the block, could walk around the block for your good health. Don't walk around the block. So you're on the wrong track. Should read, could read, don't read. You're on the wrong track. Should call, could call, don't call. You're on the wrong track. Could change, should change, should change, don't change. You're on the wrong track. Letters you haven't written, conversations you haven't had with your family, somebody you should sit down with when you get back home, get that job done. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Go back and do what you can, and if you'll do what you can, then life will give you some extraordinary things to do. We all pity the man, right? Wants to straighten out his house, go straighten up the corporation, has not yet straightened up the corporation, has not yet straightened out his garage. You've got to take care of the small disciplines before life will give you a chance to handle the more complicated disciplines. How do you think Mark Hughes got here? Scattered now throughout 14, 15 countries. Another 14, 15 countries, another 14, 15 coming up. I mean, how do you do this? You start first with the smallest of disciplines and do not neglect them and do not disregard them as being trifling. Everything matters. Everything's important. Good phrase to take home. How? Oh. Disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. If you haven't thought of it before, here it is. Everything affects everything else. It's so easy to be casual and say, well, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm telling you everything matters. Of course, some things matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Then here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects all your other disciplines. Yeah, if you'll get some new things going, make some calls you've never made before, step up your activity level, step up your labor level, develop the skills from these two days of training here, and you'll go home and work some miracles on your days, your life, your future, and your income, your business and a bigger portion of that 400 million will certainly be yours. Go for the disciplines, the smallest of disciplines, the least of disciplines like keeping your accounts in order, the smallest of disciplines. Have you ever heard this expression? I, I, oh, I don't know where it all goes. Have you ever heard that? I don't know where it all goes. Wow. Oh, we'd love to have you run her belief. You don't know where it all goes? 
how long do you think we'd last here in Herbalife if that was your philosophy sitting at the top like Mark Hughes? Let me give you the story on Mark Hughes. Mark knows where everything goes. And he started back when he only had pennies. He started back when he only had dollars. He started back when he didn't have much. But here's the key. One of the greatest extraordinary phrases that's ever been written from antiquity says, if you'll be faithful, if you'll be disciplined when the amounts are small, we'll make you a ruler, give you a position of authority when the amounts are many. So, he said, I've only got two or three distributors. I don't know where they are. Come on. If you've only got two or three, you can know when to get up, you can know when to get up, you can know when they go to bed, you can know all the details. Take care of your disciplines when the amounts are small and then life will see to it that you get some extraordinary numbers to work with like you saw the stories displayed here. Do not disregard the smallest of disciplines. Let us not neglect. Do not neglect the smallest of disciplines and build on that foundation and you can have everything you could possibly want. Okay, get going. Here's number four. Get better. There isn't any of us that can't get better. So, turn on this whole idea of personal development and personal growth. That was what my teacher shared with me to change my life. Starting a few steps from here. That convinced me. I'm telling you. For things to get better, you've got to get better. Don't ask for it to change out there. Ask for you to change here. Don't ask for a more favorable wind. We call that naive. Don't ask for better seed, better soil. This is the only planet you got. Just ask that you can get wiser and stronger and better. Be able to take care of your own responsibilities. Get better. Learn how to handle the seasons better. Let's go through them. Some stuff I did on satellite many, many years ago. Let me just review those notes for you on this getting better part. Learn how to handle the seasons of life. Number one, learn how to handle the winters. We're all going to go through some winters. Herbalife's been through a few, just the winters of the calendar in the last 12 years. How many winters? About 12. But it's not just the winters of the calendar. It's not just the winters of the seasons. There's all kinds of winters. The winter when you can't figure it out. The winter when it all goes wrong. The winter when you have all kinds of hecklers on a telephone call, right? The winter when you get that first half dozen refunds, the winters of your life, social winters, political winters that we're going through around the world, the economic winters that a lot of people are experiencing these days, personal winters when your heart is smashed in a thousand pieces. The nights are unusually long. It is simply called winter time. But here's what you've got to do in your own personal development, your own personal growth, and that is just get better at handling the winters. You can't change the winter. You can't change the seasons. But you can change the seasons, but you can change yourself. You say, what can I do about the upcoming winters of my life? The challenges that I know I'm going to face. Here's what you can do. You can get wiser and stronger and better. Just make a list of that trio of words. Wiser, stronger, better. Go home smarter than you came. Go home with more ideas than you came with. Next, get stronger. You can develop the muscle. You can develop the courage muscle. You can develop the inspiration muscle. You can develop the dedication muscle. You can get stronger. Is there anybody here that can't get stronger? Next time we see you, you may not even recognize how strong you're going to be able to become in language, style, and personality. The ability to cope, the ability to cope, the ability to handle anything that happens. And the third one is getting better. We can all get better. I've gotten better at getting better. I just want to make you make this list of four words. First, we talk about getting serious. Second, get smart. Third, get going. Fourth, get better. And here are four good words to take on. One is absorb. Develop the skill and the ability to absorb everything. Be like a sponge like you've been today. This has been a good, serious group. I appreciate that you've worked as hard as we have up here on this platform. You've rolled up your sleeves and you've gone to work and you've taken notes then I appreciate that. Absorb everything you can. Absorb the sights and the sounds and the color. Guess what? You're going to want to go back home and invest this experience into other people's lives and you can't invest it if you haven't got it. So I'm asking you to appreciate the color. I'm asking you to appreciate the auditorium. I'm asking you to appreciate what's going on here. I'm asking you to appreciate each other. Soak this all up. Soak it all up. Soak it all up. Call it. Absorb. Absorb. Absorb.
that when you get back home, you can give out, give out, give out, give out, and you'll have an extraordinary effect on the people that you reach out and touch. Here's the next one. Develop the ability to respond. That's what got me almost six years ago. Mark and Larry made that call. I responded. It touched me. The vision they gave me, the story they gave me, the pictures they painted, the numbers they gave me, what we could do together, the team we could build, dominate the industry, walk head and shoulders above anything else that's out there, have an extraordinary adventure that's only been given to a few chance to walk the summit got me touched. Now I'm asking you, however, not only to be touched with the summit numbers, the 400 million, I'm asking you to be touched with the smallest of people's challenges, don't just be touched with the challenge. I'm asking you to be touched with the problem. Let people's problems get to you. Let people's problems touch your heart this year like never before. Be touched. Let life touch you. It'll let it kill you, but let it touch you. The problems that are out there, people struggling with their economy, struggling with their health, struggling with their future. I'm asking you to let that get around your heart. Let it do something to you. Don't go untouched. Don't go on unmoved. When you walk out of here, open yourself up. Don't build up the wall, the same wall that keeps out disappointment, keeps out happiness and opportunity. Take the wall down and let yourself be touched by what's going on out there. Let sad things make you sad as well as happy things make you happy. Let your heart get touched and you'll have good hands then to take this product to the marketplace. Here's number three. Develop the ability to reflect. Long after this session is over, I'm asking you to go back over it one more time. I'm asking you, at the end of the day, go back over your day. I'm asking you, at the end of the week, go back over your week. Make that week more valuable. At the end of the month, go back over your months. At the end of a conversation, go back over the conversation. Go back over the conversation. How did it go and what did you do? Learn by reflecting. I call it running the tapes again of your own experiences and you say, why do that? Here's why. It's a developed extraordinary ability to gather up the past and invest it in the future. What a next year you could have if you pay more attention this year. Soak it up, gather it up, and reflect at certain times what's going on and what's happening. And this year will take a more powerful place in your experience. And then when you get ready to deliver in 1993, people will not believe the words you've chosen. They will not believe in heart and soul that you've mixed with words. They won't believe the power you've got. A few simple things here are getting better. Then here's the last one, and that's to share. You've got this extraordinary opportunity now. Let us not keep it. Let us share it. Let us reach out with a long reach, a strong reach, an unprecedented reach. Let us reach out and touch people, not just with our opportunity. Let's touch people with our lives. Let's touch people with our experiences. Let's touch people with our heart and soul. Let's don't just touch people with a marketing plan and a distributor kit. Let's touch people with their health. Yes. With an opportunity. Yes. But here's a commitment I'd like to have you make to me. Let's help people with their lives, not just their health. Let it be said, if they were around us one week, one month, or a lifetime, that when they got around us, not only did we talk about money, not only did we talk about products, we talked about life. We talked about getting better. We talked about becoming all that you can become. We talked about picking up a challenge. We talked about not settling for less than you can possibly be. Let's do that. Let's develop those abilities now. Here's my last two parts to make this your best year ever. Get excited. Excitement is not just, you know, excitement is not just, you know, excitement that runs deep is the excitement that really lasts for a lifetime, not surface excitement. There's been a lot of noise here, but what I really appreciate in the field is that this room is full of more than noise. It's full of more than sound. I'll tell you what's really going to serve you well, and that's the excitement you feel inside that isn't even properly expressed on the outside. The excitement that runs deep, the excitement that runs deep, the excitement that stirs commitment, the excitement that stirs courage. Give me the chance, and I will get the job done. That kind of excitement. Develop that kind of attitude. Get excited about your own skills. Get excited about your own abilities. You can put it into words. If I can start with nothing and finally stand on this platform delivering the best words I can choose. Words are clumsy at best when you try to express what's going on in your heart, your head, but I've done my best. But I'm telling you, if I can find the words, you can find the words. And here's a key here. Communicate. Don't leave it unsaid. Somebody's got some congratulations coming. 
Don't fail to congratulate them. If a distributor has got a word of praise coming, don't fail to give it. Don't fail to say it. Find the best words you can. Struggle with the best words you can. Borrow some words if you have to. I borrow all kinds of words. Winston Churchill one time said, Truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, and ignorance may deride it, but in the end there it is. See, I love to borrow that. I mean, you know, that's better said than I could say it. See, that's well said. You could stay up all night and not think of that. I mean, it's well said. I'm asking you to borrow the words that have come from this platform. Borrow the words that have come from the top ten. Borrow the words that have come from the distributors who have shared so elegantly with you. Borrow their words. Borrow their notes. But then I'm asking you to start choosing the best words you can. We want you to get good at these skills of communicating, skills of touching people's lives with words, touching their heart with words, helping them to see something they've never been able to see before by your word. Choose the best words you can. Don't fail with an opportunity to challenge yourself to choose good words. Search for the words. Struggle for the words, but don't let somebody within the scope of your influence go without your words. Words work miracles. Words can help people to see something they've never seen before. There's a lot of people you haven't got. So yet, they can't see how they can possibly be healthy. And if you come along with your good words, you can turn on all the lights for them. They can't see how they can possibly be successful. And if you come along with your testimonial, that's why Herbalife is built on testimonials. Words that were miracles help people to see. And when you come along and tell your story, people are going to say it before you got here. I was blind. And now that you've talked to me, I can see. I can see the possibilities. I can see the opportunity. I can see that if I take a hold of this thing, I can change my life. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. I'm asking you, don't miss the chance to work miracles with your words. Get excited about your possibility to work miracles with words. Well, now here's my last word to you. And I'm finished for this day, but let me give you this last one to make this your best year ever. Get away. Get away, balance your life, take care of your family, take care of your responsibilities, take care of your spirituality, take care of your spirituality, take care of good friendships. We've got to have some friends. That's why I'm here. I made these extraordinary friendships way back when, and it lasts all these years. Now, it got me an invitation to participate in something so extraordinary. This came about from a friendship. Now I have the skill. Somebody says, well, you know, they offered you millions and a chance here just because you were friends. No, you don't just offer your friends millions. No, they got to have some skills. So I did bring skills. But I'm telling you, my chance to bring my gifts and my skills to you today was because I nourished these friendships over all these years. But here's the secret to my success. I stood up and did it again. Stood up and I did it again and I did it again. And I did it again. All those many years ago I did it when I was scared. And I did it when I didn't want to. And I did it when I was ill. And I did it when I didn't work well. And I did it when they didn't appreciate it. And I did it when they didn't appreciate it. And I did it a lot of times when I didn't know much what I was doing. I just did it anyway. <laughs> and now, all these years later, I'm asked to walk on this stage with the greatest introduction I've ever had. The greatest response, spite of the downturn, the money downturn, the social downturn, the personal downturn, the whatever it is, just get stronger, get better. We've all got those personal winners. We know what those are like. Barbara Streisand sings it. Used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be. Don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor until we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs. You don't say you need me, and you don't bring me flowers anymore. It's a winter song. But hey, we're acquainted with all those personal winters and all the rest of it. The key is not to wish for a better winter. The key is to wish for more strength, more wisdom, more courage. Get better, get wiser, get stronger. Here's number two. Learn to take advantage of the spring. Spring means opportunity. And we've got a fresh spring going here. It's called a spring like no other. The spring. And opportunity like no other for you. But here's a clue. Spring is not a guarantee of a harvest in the fall. In the autumn harvest. Oh, here's what you must learn to do. Underline the two words if you're taking notes. Take advantage. 
take advantage of the spring. Don't just be faked out by the spring because the nice weather has come. Looks like everything is going to be a lot better. The winter's finally passed. The spring is here telling you that's not going to do it for you. Just because the spring is here, it's not going to do it for you. You got to seize it with your own two hands and take advantage. Read the books, study the tapes, go back through your notes, get ready to cash in on the spring. And now there's a sense of urgency here. Here's why spring doesn't last that long. To be able to say, I just got back, doesn't last that long. It's called the springtime of opportunity. Postpone a few things in the springtime, get the job done. Set aside a few things in the springtime, get the job done. Where I was raised in Idaho farm country, what if you asked a farmer to go bowling in the spring? What would he probably say? You would say, you're insane. You can go bowling in the winter when you can't plant the crop. You can't go bowling in the spring. You only got a certain piece of time. And you got to get it done in that certain window of opportunity. And that's what we've got here. A window of opportunity. Let's take advantage of it. It's called taking advantage of the spring. And there's also an urgency here. How many springs have you got in a lifetime? Not very many. Life is brief at the longest. Music the Beatles wrote, our life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short. But it is short. There's an urgency here. Don't waste your springs. Don't just let them pass, hoping the time will pass. Take advantage. Last year it was seize the moment. And I'm asking you now this season to seize the spring opportunity. You've got a new organization going, seize the spring. You've got a new distributor going, seize the spring. You've got a new life situation going, seize the spring. Take advantage of it. Don't let it pass without giving it the best of your two hands and your attention. First, learn how to handle the winter. Second, take advantage of the spring. Number three, in the summer, learn to nourish and protect. We got some major challenges now come summertime. One is to nourish our values. Take care of them, feed them. Don't let them go hungry. Don't let them go wanting in nourishment and care. Then here's something else we've got to do in the summer. Defend ourselves against the enemies. Summertime is a unique time. It's a time of opportunity. It's also a time of challenge. But what else is new? It's what life is called. The last six and a half thousand years reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Opportunity mixed with challenge. We've got a chance to grow like never before. But I'm telling you, there's going to be many enemies that's going to try to prevent. As soon as you plant the garden, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And you've got to learn not only to nourish your values, you've got to learn to do battle with your enemies. Whatever threatens you, I'm asking you to threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility. But don't take any off anybody. Somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk. Negative thinking. Putting it all down. I'm telling you. Walk away if you have to. Walk away. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Now some of our enemies are on the outside. But here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. Let me give you a quick list. Yeah. You've got to do battle with your own indifference. Boy, it's easy to coast, especially if you've accomplished something extraordinary. You know, it's easy to say, I gotta relax. Here's the key. Not too long. The weeds will take over your plan if you rest too long. Don't rest too long. Indecision. You've gotta make those decisions. The ones that don't turn out to be good give you experience to make better decisions. Don't let much time go by without making some decisions. The ones that you can make quickly. Make them quickly. The ones that take time, take your time. But get those decisions made. Don't let indecision be an enemy. Rob you of the future, empty your bank account, leave you with zero in the purse. Don't let that happen. The next one is doubt. Sure, there's doubts on the outside. People doubt that America's gonna make it. People doubt that Europe's gonna make it. They doubt that Russia's gonna make it. Poland's gonna make it. Czechoslovakia's gonna make it. They doubt the whole world is going to make it. But I'm asking you not to pick up all those doubts. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, and believe. Drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog driving you into a small corner. Don't doubt the future.
Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. Here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago to help take something around the world, so can you. If I can stand on this platform, Idaho farm boy raising obscurity, so can you. If the millionaire team can do it, the president's team can do it. Walk off with the diamonds, the trophies, so can you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. We haven't sold too short. That's why Mark, Larry, and Dr. Kateson and I have decided to invest the big share of our life these four days in being with all of you. If we didn't think you were worth it, we wouldn't have shown up. We don't need to conduct another meeting. We don't need to walk on another stage. We don't need to get up early like we get up. Don't need it except for the challenge and the opportunity to invest in this many people's lives. Who wouldn't get up early to have a chance to work miracles and invest in this many people's lives and help turn the world upside down for better nutrition? Call her of a life. Here's the next one. What? I'm asking you to drive worry into a small corner. You better worry some. All this negative stuff certainly serves some purpose. But the key is for you to be the master, not the servant. If it's two o'clock in the morning and your daughter's not home yet, best you worry in New York City. If you step off the curb and one of those yellow taxes is coming, best you worry. But here's what I'm asking you to do. You be the master of worry. Drive it into a small corner. Don't let it loose. And I'm asking you to go home with some new faith and some new courage. I'm asking you, don't worry. Drive it into a small corner. We've all got concerns and sometimes we all wonder. And sometimes there's a little crack of doubt. You worry a little. But I'm telling you, drive it into a small corner. Drive your worries into a small corner. I promise you, from this platform, the dedication of the executives that you've seen and the president's team members and the people that have walked off with one through ten, I'm telling you, we're all dedicated to help this Herbalife future that includes all of you be the most spectacular thing that's happened in the 90s. I promise you not to worry because you're in good hands. And now what I want you to be able to say if you give Mark Hughes a telephone call or if you have a chance to talk to Mark Hughes in person. Whatever village you've come from, whatever street you've come from, wherever you come from. I'd like for you to be able to say sincerely and honestly, with all the dedication you possibly can, Mark Hughes. I want you to go to bed at night and sleep like a baby because where I came from, when I go back and represent Herbalife in that community, I want to reassure you, Mark Hughes, Herbalife, and that community is in good hands. I want some of you from Germany to get together, from a little coalition from Germany. After you've gotten out there and gotten your hands into it and you've had a chance to work in labor for a while, send Mark Hughes a message and say, I'm Mark Hughes. The distributors that have now joined forces in Germany, you can rest easy. Mark Hughes in Germany, Herbalife is in good hands. And all of the rest of the countries, make that your dedication. Make it personal. Make it collective as an organization. This incredible opportunity has been dropped in our lap. Been given to us. We're going to take it to the marketplace. And we're going to take it to the marketplace with good hands. Steady hands. Growing hands. Intelligent hands that can go touch people and get the job done. I'm asking you to commit to Herbalife. A couple more enemies of the mind you've got to do battle with in the summer. One is pessimism that tries to get you only to see the negative side. Of course there's the negative side. Life is part negative. What else is new? If the glass is half empty, it is half empty. You say, well, I've only been taught to see that it's half full. Well, sure, it's half full, but it's also. I mean, can't you handle that? I mean, you know, that's not too difficult. But here's what pessimism would try to get you to believe that it's only happened. And when pessimism comes to your mind, you've got to educate pessimism. Because pessimism is stupid. Pessimism tries to get you to believe that it's only half empty. You've got to say, pessimism, you've never been to school too dumb and stupid. Of course it's half empty, but it's not only half empty. It's also half full. I'm asking you to be in charge. 
Be in charge of your own mind. Be in charge of your own destiny. But battle with your enemy in the summertime. In the summertime, you've got to learn to love like a mother. Hate like a father. Give life like a mother. Take life like a father. Father says to whatever threatens his family, take two or three more steps toward this family and threaten them. You'll cease to exist. I'm father, I kill the battle with your enemies. Now, it's also possible to love like a father and hate like a mother. I'm not saying that is impossible. Nothing more dangerous than an angry mother. I saw an article in a magazine a little bit ago in Canada showed a man with some claw marks on his back. Had his shirt off and big chief marks on his neck. This man was out in the woods, had his flash camera, saw a mama bear with a little cub, thought, Bang, this is cute. Took a flash picture. Mama bear takes unkindly to this flash picture, promptly chases the man, catches him, and almost kills him before somebody rescues him. So beware, mama bear, okay? Love like a father, hate like a mother, give life like a mother, take life like a father, or however you want to arrange it, just so you nourish your values, nourish your family, nourish what's valuable for you, nourish your organization, nourish your distributors, nourish your customers, take care of your responsibilities, feed, nourish. But then I'm also asking you to do battle with your enemies, take a sword to your enemies. Whatever's going to destroy those values, take a sword through it. If it's worry, take a sword too. If it's a threat, threaten back. You've got to be like your bloodstream, good illustration, red corpuscles to nourish like a mother, white corpuscles to fight and kill like a father. You've got to do some negative thinking and just think positive. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. White corpuscles say, just show me some infection. I'll kill it. I'm whatever threatens this body and its future gets threatened. Whatever's not to kill this body gets killed. I'm asking you. Take a sword to your enemies, whether they're on the outside or whether they're on the inside. Protect your family. Protect your future. Protect your values, love, nourish. But also do battle with whatever is out there to do battle with. Take some courage from some of those that have been through the battle. They've given you their stories on the stage. They've been through it. They know what it's all about. Take some courage from that and in the summer now, here's the last one in the harvest time. Number four, take your harvest and all that comes your way with full responsibility. Don't complain. That fourth season complaining, I'm telling you, could ruin all of your chances. Complaining sometimes starts with an infection. If you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. You battle with it in the harvest time, reap your harvest without complaint. It's your crop. You sowed it. You either made the calls or didn't make the calls. You wrote the letters, you didn't write the letters. You were steady or you weren't steady. You did it or you didn't do it. You put together a good day or you didn't put together a good day. Take responsibility when the harvest time finally comes and say, hey, it's my crop. Got to take responsibility for it. Do not complain. And then here's the next one. Do not apologize if you've done well. We offer no apologies when these winners that walked across this stage here go back to their communities. We offer no apology for making the kind of money they make because of the lives they touched and the people that they helped. No telling what would have happened if these people had not touched many people's lives, who touched many people's lives when you go back to the community. All of you that were winners here, I asked you to go back with no apology because you've done your job well and you've given good hands to everybody you've touched. You deserve all the money. Everything you are or ever will be is up to you. You are the master of your own fate. The architect of your own destiny. You are self-made, completely responsible for the quality of your life and for your results. The principle of self-development is one of the vital keys to the psychology of success. Self-development requires self-discipline, hard work, and persistence. It builds character, ability, and self-esteem. The more you work on yourself, the more you like and respect and believe in yourself. The more self-confidence you have, the greater the feeling of personal fulfillment you experience. Men and women who accomplish great things with their lives are not necessarily better or smarter or more gifted than others. They are usually just individuals who have made the efforts necessary to develop their potential to a greater degree than the ordinary. The wonderful thing about our free society is that you can become just about anything you really want 
if you are willing to pay the price in terms of hard work on yourself. There's no limit to how far you can go except for the limits you place on yourself. I once read a quote from Abraham Lincoln that had a profound effect on my life. It was written in his diary as a young man in Springfield that said, I will study and prepare myself and someday my chance will come. If you study and prepare yourself, your chance will come too. You will meet people unexpectedly who will enable you to utilize your knowledge. You will get phone calls and letters in the mail. You will come across articles and advertisements that lead you to use your skills and abilities. One of the most important of the mental laws is the law of correspondence, which says, as within, so it's your outer circumstances in every area will correspond with your inner world. Your material financial world will reflect the quality and quantity of preparation you have engaged in. Every effort, small or large, accumulates and grows like a snowball rolling down a hill. Every act of delayed gratification, discipline, and self-development counts for something. Every extraordinary accomplishment is preceded by thousands of hours of ordinary preparation. Just as a spring becomes a trickle, a trickle becomes a brook. Brooks create streams. And finally, many streams create an enormous river that flows inexorably, unstoppably, carrying everything before it to the sea. But so it is with self-development. Every achievement that is recognized and applauded is preceded by countless small efforts, failures, disappointments, and setbacks that no one ever sees. You can learn whatever you need to be successful. There is more information available today to help you to be more effective than ever before existed. The smartest and most successful men and women who ever lived have poured the best of everything they know into books, tapes, seminars, and video cassettes. Some of the most valuable information on succeeding in any field is available to you in exchange for a few dollars and some hard, hard work. Would you like to double your income? How about increasing your income ten times? A thousand percent. Would you like that? If I can show you a simple formula that is virtually guaranteed to work to double, triple, quadruple your income, would you try it? Most people will say yes, but only about one in twenty. According to my experience, we'll actually do it. Here it is, a simple formula. But first, a simple question. Do you believe it is possible for you to increase your effectiveness and improve your productivity by 2% over the next month? The next 30 days? Could you do it if your life depended on it? Of course you could. One or two small changes in your daily routine. A little bit better time management. A little bit more effectiveness in your key result. Areas could give you a 2% improvement. Now having done it the first month, could you do it again the second month 2% more? How about the third month? Could you by working steadily on yourself a little bit each day, managing your time a little better, improving your overall productivity? Could you increase your performance and your effectiveness by 2% in the third month? Of course you could. Almost anyone could if they cared enough to apply themselves. You get onto a learning curve. Well, 2% per month compounded translates into 26% per year. 26% per year productivity, improvement through personal development, skill enhancement, and additional training is a reasonable, believable, even modest, but surely attainable goal. 26% per year compounded will equal 100% improvement in 3 years, 1000% improvement in 10 years. This simple 2% formula can be the most important success formula you ever learn. Now here's how it works. You first of all determine your aim. Do you really want to achieve great financial success in your work? Do you want it badly enough to pay the price in terms of preparation? Assuming the answer is yes, here's what you do. First of all, you stop or dramatically cut back on all those activities that do not contribute anything to your life. Then become an avid reader. Reading is to the mind as exercise is to the body. Reading is vital to your success. Not only does it require total concentration, but you learn things by reading that you cannot learn any other way. There is no substitute for it. In fact, if you read just one book per month to develop or improve yourself in some way, it will put you in the top 1% in terms of personal development. If you read one book per week, which you can do if you read one hour per day, that will translate into 52 books per year, 520 books over 10 years. 
If you read 520 books to improve yourself and enhance your effectiveness at work in a world where the average person reads less than one book per year, you think it might give you the edge? A critical winning edge that makes all the difference between success and failure. You bet it would. One book per week would so change the course of your life in a positive way that you would be astonished. And it won't take 10 years. You will begin to see significant changes in the quality of your life and your results within months. Sometimes within weeks, sometimes within days. Well, you begin by getting up each morning two hours before your first appointment or before you have to be at work, earlier if necessary. Then, before you leave the house, rewrite your major goals and a brief description of your goals for the day. Just a few lines. It takes you a couple of minutes to rewrite those goals and impress them into your mind. This exercise activates your subconscious and gives you a sense of purpose and focus for the hours ahead. Next, and this is very important. Listen to educational audio cassettes during traveling time in your car. And if you use public transportation or if you're flying, the average car owner drives 12,000 to 25,000 miles per year. This is as many as 500 to 1,000 hours per year in the car. This translates into 12 and a half to 25, 40 hour weeks sitting in the car behind the wheel, enjoying prime learning time. This is the equivalent of one to two university semesters. You can become one of the best educated and most Highly motivated, well-informed people of our society simply by listening to audio cassettes in your car. If you're not listening to audio cassettes in your car continually, you're missing hundreds of hours of prime learning time. And every hour you miss is going to cost you in lost earnings and diminished potential. The third leg of the triangle of self-development, the first two being reading and listening to audio cassettes, is courses and seminars put on by people who have achieved success in the subjects they are talking about. And this is important. Attend at least four seminars or courses per year, one every three months. Take all the training you can get and never stop learning. If your company supplies you with training opportunities, take every single one of them. And if your company does not, remember you are totally 100% responsible for your ongoing education. The whole purpose of an education, even up to university level, is simply to teach you how to learn. From then on, it's up to you to apply the lessons. I think that the major difference between winners and losers is their attitude towards spending money on improving themselves. Winners recognize that they are their most precious asset. Winners are always investing in improving the quality of their thinking and the quality of their knowledge. But they recognize that the functioning of their mind, more than anything else, is going to determine everything that happens to them, and they're always working on achieving a higher level of mental fitness and mental preparedness. Remember, they say that luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. Winners in almost every field are characterized by the fact that they know more, that they have more practical knowledge acquired through study and experience than do the underachievers. It's as simple as that. Losers always make excuses for not investing in themselves. You've probably all heard the things they say. They say things like, I can't afford it, which means, of course, that I won't afford it. They usually have money for clothes, money for socializing, money for liquor, and money for travel, but they don't have money to invest in their own minds. They say, I don't have the time, which means, of course, that they won't make the time to invest in themselves. And the worst of all, they say, I don't need that because I know all that stuff already. Most losers fall into the category of what they call the unconscious incompetent. This is the person who does not know and does not know that he does not know. The truly hopeless case? People with limited education are aware of how little they know relative to how much there is to learn, so they're continually seeking new information. But university graduates often think they've learned everything there is to know and they stop reading when they leave campus. The bottom line of the losing mentality is that the loser doesn't believe in himself or herself. The loser doesn't believe that any efforts in self-development would change anything, so they don't even try. Remember, a person who does not read is no better than a person who cannot read. A person who does not work on himself or herself is no better than a person who cannot. Ignorance is one of the greatest enemies of mankind, and today in our wide-open society, ignorance is self-inflicted and inexcusable. Number one, 
Begin right now, today, to become a perpetual learning machine. Read, study, listen to tapes, take courses continually. One hour per day studying any subject will make you an authority in three years, a national expert in five, and an international authority in seven. Number two, remain teachable. Remain open, interested, curious. In all your life, you will never learn all there is to know about even one subject. Even about yourself, for instance. Number three, if you want to be successful, study success. Become an expert on success. Learn proven success methods from others so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Number four, get around other successful people. Fly with eagles, don't scratch with turkeys. Learn from them. Ask their advice on what to do, what to read, what courses to take, what tapes to listen to, and be willing to help others with advice on success as you learn it. Number five, the human being is an organism. And if you're not growing with the input of new information and ideas, you're stagnating. Most people are stuck in a rut because they stop growing. Don't let this happen to you. When you stop taking in new information, your mind and your brain begin to atrophy, and you tend to fall into a state of lethargy and depression. It is new information that gets you out of it. Number six. As Jim Rohn says in the audio cassette program, Seven Secrets of Wealth and Happiness, work at least as hard on yourself as you do on your job. Work at least as hard on yourself as you do in your job. Remember, you are your most valuable asset. And finally, number seven, the self-respect and self-confidence that comes as a result of learning and growing toward the fulfillment of your potential is the root source of self-esteem and self.